tartar sandwich. And uh, you might hear tartar and think, wait, raw ham? No, there's nothing raw about it. It's the stuff that you put in with the ham that makes it the tartar. Check it out. Okay, so we're supposed to go. Okay. Uh, do you see that? Yes. Excellent. And then we need to do this from the beginning. And excellent. We're all set. I think we're all ready to go, Nancy. Thank you so much. I can't, um, I can't, once again, it's so odd with Zoom. I can't see myself, which is never a problem, but I can't see any of you either. So Nancy, you know, if there are questions, feel free to put them in the chat room and Nancy will field them uh, for you. You can interrupt me during the presentation. You can wait until the end of the presentation. Uh, you know, whatever. We're easy peasy here. We're easy, very easy going, not a stuffy at all presentation um, at all. So always feel free to interrupt. It's, it's never a problem. Uh, I am wildly interested in this topic of extinct, extinct species. And I probably have since I was a little girl, I do have a photograph of myself, I should put into this presentation, uh, of me sitting next to a taxidermy barred owl when I was probably two or three or three years old. So uh, some, uh, ex, taxidermy and extinct species and things like this have always kind of fascinated me. And not in a macabre way, just in that it is absolutely mind blowing to me that in animals that were once so abundant just disappeared. Um, I mean, the dinosaurs, it's one thing, but we're talking things that are fairly modern. I'm talking about 18th and 19th and even into the 20th century because we're still losing species to this day. But the characters that I've been presenting in the series are four of, to me, the most heart-wrenching. And tonight is one of the most famous of all. I think the dodo is probably the poster child for all extinct species, but the passenger pigeon is its extinction came fairly recently. And it was a bird that was very abundant here in Connecticut. And so it's not something like the dodo that lived in Mauritius or the thylacine that was in Tasmania. This was something that its breeding ground was right here in Connecticut and, um, and it's gone. So in the beginning of the 19th century, the population of this bird was unimaginable. It numbered in the billions. And, there is an absolutely incredible documentary called From Billions to None that you can watch for free on YouTube about the passenger pigeon. And it's absolutely incredible. It's a, maybe like an hour and change long from billions to none. And I highly recommend it if you enjoy this presentation, uh, see it done in a documentary and a really well done one. Uh, they were colonial species and there were bands of them that were two miles wide and up to 300 miles long. It took them days to move over an area. And the species was believed to have made about 40% of the bird population in all of North America. Now, all the animals that we've been talking about, um, the dodo lived on an island, the thylacine lived on an island. I mean, a big island, Tasmania is a big island, Mauritius, not as much. Uh, the great auk, it only bred in a few places. It basically, it was an island animal as well, but it had a very small breeding area. The passenger pigeon only lived in North America. That's a really big island, but it's a continent. So when you have a species that isn't like really widely dispersed, that's when human tampering can really impact their populations. And that's what happened to this bird. By the end of the century, they were gone from the wild and only a few of them remained in a few zoological collections. They were quite literally wiped off our planet in 40 years, billions to none in 40 years. Amazing. So my hero and the person that really inspired me to develop this lecture series is this man, Errol Fuller, who is a friend of mine. I cannot believe I'm a friend with Errol. Um, Errol's just a really terrific guy. I fell in love with Errol in 2015. I learned about him in 2015. I was incredibly ill, um, like almost kicked the bucket ill. And I was in bed for uh, several months. And what does somebody who's you know pretty sick do when she's laying in bed being really sick? Reads about dead animals. So of course I start finding out about this 
our artist, author, Errol Fuller, he's British, um, and all of these books that he's written about extinct species. And I go down a major rabbit hole. Well, Errol Fuller is primarily an artist. He made his fame and fortune in England by being an artist. As he said, he painted disreputable things like people playing snooker and boxing and things like that. He's a wonderful artist. Um, but Errol also happens to be the world's foremost authority on extinct species. Well, wouldn't you know, I start, you know, what do I do at 2 a.m. when I'm waking up and I'm in pain? I go on Amazon and buy all of his books. So here are just a handful. Of course, I own all of them, but I have with me tonight his Passenger Pigeon book, um, his Extinct Birds book. He's written books with uh, The Lost Birds of Paradise with Sir, uh, David Attenborough. Um, and what I love so much about Errol's books and his writing is that he writes for people like us. They're not stuffy scientific books. First of all, they're beautiful because he is an artist and he, he lays them out with an artist's eye, but also they're easy to read and easy to comprehend. So folks like me, I'm not a scientist, can easily fall down this rabbit hole. Well, I wrote him a fan letter at the insistence of a very pushy friend who was helping me out when I was sick not expecting to hear back from him. And he wrote back to me and we began writing back and forth all the time to the point where um, he's written the cover story for our quarterly newsletter here at White Memorial. And I am absolutely thrilled to say that he's going to be doing a virtual program for us on March 26th. Uh, put that on your calendars. It's, um, uh, Errol, it's show and tell with Errol Fuller because Errol also owns the most extensive collection of Victorian taxidermy in the world. And he has great auks and passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons weren't in the UK, by the way, only in North America. But Errol has them in his collection, as well as many other things. And I asked him to select from his collections his favorite things. And he's just going to talk about it. I cannot wait. Anyway, so um, check him out, errolfuller.com. And I hope that you can join us at White Memorial on March 26th. Uh, for his program, Show and Tell with Errol Fuller. I love this man. I mean, he's changed my life. The passenger pigeon, uh, it was named because it was a bird of passage and it was always looking for food. And once a year, it would stop to breed as well. The Latin name means wandering migrant. This is John James Audubon's um, picture. And one of my other favorite people, Rex Frazier, who was painting, will show up later on in the presentation. Rex always made fun of this because he said, passenger pigeons and Brazier uh, observed these birds in the wild. And so did Audubon, but Brazier really observed them because he painted from life. Um, Audubon painted from dead specimens. Brazier said that this is a behavior that would never happen with this bird. So I thought that's kind of interesting, um, very interesting. But anyway, there's Ectopistes migratorius, meaning the wandering migrant. They were about 15 to 16 inches in length and the male was really, uh, really beautiful, as is usually the case. The male of species is always very colorful. It's like, hey, girls, look at me. And the girls are duller in color because they're sitting on nests and, you know, camouflaging themselves. Uh, but the males had this beautiful iridescent bronze and green and purple. Um, the females were more of a, a duller color brown with some speckling on the wing wings. Um, their feet were uh, a paler red than the males. Um, the iris was an orange red in them, and it had a naked orbital green grayish blue on the outside. The immature were similar to the adult female with some changes in their feather. And the sound wasn't a cooing, but a shriek, chatter, or cluck. Uh, collectively was a cacophony. Can you imagine billions of these birds, millions of these birds are flying over you and all talking at the same time? Yeah, that's a cacophony, all right. Their wingspan was massive, 22 to 24 inches, so two feet wide, and they flew at speeds of 60 miles per hour. <clears throat> to give you an idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, how different they, uh, they look from another species, these are pencil drawings from a man named Julian Pender Hume, a passenger pigeon at the top and a pink pigeon at the bottom. That bird on the top is made for speed. He's like a, an arrow, um, so they flew fast, in these massive colonies, and that was always to find a place to find food. So colonialization happened. This bird, of course, was having uh, not a problem at all with the Native uh, Americans that lived here in North America, but then the colonials arrived. 
and here they are in the land of plenty. So just imagine this, you're living in the early 19th century um, with your own blood, sweat, and tears. You cleared a little patch of forest, you cultivate it, and you're finally reaping the rewards of your labor, your fruits and vegetables available to you, enough to feed your family and your livestock in the winter. And you stand admiring this beautiful creation that you've made. And all of a sudden in the distance, you hear this strange sound. It's a, a rustle or a buzz. And you could survey your old orchards and your young crops and the surrounding forests, and you see nothing. And the strange sound continues to swell. Now it sounds like drumming. And then sooner it sounds like thunder. And then a few pass, pigeons pass over and then more and more until the sky turns dark and the sun is completely obliterated. The mass moves together and quickly and the sound becomes deafening. The pigeons begin landing in the forest and into your orchards and into your fields. Their droppings rain from the sky. Trees in the forest and orchards break under the immense weight of the swamp. You take your gun out and you shoot a few for your dinner. And in about four days, they finally disappear as quickly as they arrived. And in their wake is dung three inches deep. Your crops are destroyed. Your orchards are destroyed. No food for your family or your livestock. Your droppings have followed the water and you have to start all over again. So this is the colonial's first impression of the passenger pigeon. It's a very interesting print. I think I got this off of Wikipedia. And even though um, it's 1920 that it was made, it's sort of ribbons and ribbons and ribbons of, uh, of passenger pigeons as you know, their lines just went on for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And another really interesting thing that I found was this music made by a man, Wallace Craig. This is from 1911. Musical notes documenting some vocalizations of the extinct passenger pigeon. I've got a lot of musical friends, but I keep forgetting to ask them to play these things. But uh, this is a sound of the, uh, what the bird would make, uh, giving one flap of its wings at a female on a perch. This all sounds like breeding behavior, one flap of the wing towards a female with each double note. Um, gently towards the mate that's what it, the sound would be like and i just thought that that was very interesting because interestingly enough we have no recordings of these birds even though the last one died in captivity in 1914 um we still don't really know what they sounded like interesting so the range the orange is um their range and the breeding range is red and as you can see there we are right in connecticut in their breeding ground they were, um, they were nomads. They were always on the move. And they had to be because they had to find food. And you've got that many birds, you always have to be moving around. But there was abundant forest, plenty of their, the food that they needed. So their principal, principal nesting sites were in Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Ontario, Pennsylvania, New York, and New England. But the birds' normal distribution also was much larger. Um, Lewis and Clark saw them in uh, and recorded them in Idaho. So that's pretty far west. So they did reach further across North America, but that's a very large range. And their breeding ground, however, was very, very small. Um, the seeds, uh, fruits, especially beech nuts and acorns, chestnuts, which by the way, were gone by 1905 because our American chestnut went down the tubes because of a blight. Um, and there's also, by the way, an organization called the American Chestnut Foundation that is trying to bring back the American Chestnut. And that's a program, Nancy, that you should have. I'll, I'll give you some, um, some people that could do that for you. Absolutely fascinating, the work that these people are doing right here in Connecticut to bring back this majestic tree. I know I'm, I'm digressing, but I have an old farmhouse in Winchester built in 1799. And have a lot of work done on it. And when we were peeling off the layers and the builders saw that the skeleton of my home was the Amer Native American chestnut, they were bowing and genuflecting. It was just the greatest tree of all. So these birds re really real, um, relied on this food, but primarily acorns and hickory nuts. They could consume a half a cup of acorns whole into a two inch head. Think about that, their heads were two inches, but they would devour these acorns whole and store them in a special compartment, like a gizzard for later digestion. And the birds traveled where the mast was. The mast is where is, a mast is um, 
is basically the fruits of a tree that are falling to the ground. That's a mass. You always know that wildlife is happy when there's a really good mass. If you hear tons of acorns dropping, animals are really going to benefit from, from that. Uh, the birds traveled where the mass was. Forest trees synchronize reproduction and put out large amounts of nuts. And where trees were masting, that's where the colonies all, all went. I mean, just you can start already. You know, everybody knows that humans were the reason these birds disappeared, but there were so many other other things that happened that led up to the demise of this bird. I don't know what museum these came from. A lot of these things I can credit, and other things. I, I'm an internet pirate. What can I say? They were monogamous um, pairs nesting once a year in a crude twig. They made a crude twig nest, a very short incubation of about 13 days. The chick fed, um, was fed pigeon milk from the parent's crop and the parents stayed with the chick. This is amazing for just about two weeks. And then they took off before the little chick even fledged. So the poor little chick is left in the nest. The parents are like, I'm out of here. I've got to go and find food somewhere else. And after about two days, these very plump chicks would fall out of the nest and wander around for a few days until they could fly. So sad. Very small eggs. We have an egg collection here at White Memorial. And Carrie Schfett, our education director, and I were certain that if we went up and this, they're being cataloged right now. They've been around for a long time, but nobody's ever cataloged them. Carrie and I were certain we were going to go up there and find a passenger pigeon egg. And we went through boxes and boxes, hundreds upon hundreds of eggs, and we didn't find any. It was, a, it was kind of a bummer. I, I thought that we would have one, but no. Of course, what happened with birds is as their numbers were dropping, and especially things like the great auk, as their numbers started dropping, then their eggs became collectible. So it's just these animals couldn't win. Here's one from 1849. Very collectible. Eggs were very collectible. Here they are. Oh, hi. You look so sweet, sweet. And I'm going to leave you after two weeks and you're on your own, kid. Here's a live passenger pigeon chick from 1896. Obviously uh, in captivity, probably in Cincinnati, Ohio. Plump little beggar. But here is their demise, exploitation and habitat destruction. The passenger pigeon was doomed. It could not exist in an industrial world. The day the colonials stepped foot in North America was the beginning of the end for these birds because we just started cutting down forests. So look at the change in virgin old growth forest between 1620 and 1990. And right there is a primary reason why this bird couldn't exist. Even if they cloned it today, it could never exist. There's some animals that, you know, maybe the great auk, possibly the great auk could exist if we cloned it and brought it back. Um, the thylacine, maybe. The dodo, definitely not. The passenger pigeon, definitely not. We just took everything, their whole habitat. There'd be nothing for them to eat. And they were colonial species. They had to be living in these big flocks. Um, it, it just wouldn't happen in this day and age. The native people and frontier settlers, the bird was a really important food source. And the Seneca Indians moved their camps to the edges of the breeding colonies. They'd wait for the eggs to hatch and let the chicks fledge and eat the nestlings. They believed it was an act of respect to let the adults go. And the bir birds were reserved in salt and dried or packed in oil, uh, but they didn't overhunt. They, they, they didn't do what the colonials did. They were living as native people always have done, they've always lived in harmony with nature. They get it. I don't know why we couldn't. The earlier settlers found them very tasty, and this was a land of plenty. Rivers were teeming with fish, and there was so much forest land, it appeared that all of Europe could settle there. Billions of pigeons were there, and they ate the adults and preserved them as well, but rendered the fat from the nestlings to use as lard. Uh, feathers from the adults were also used in bedding, and they were a, the bird was a very important natural resource. 
in different ways of uh, uh, catching them as well. Hiding in a blind, baiting them. But they were a really easy target. Um, there were stories of people, the, the flocks just flying over and people throwing potatoes in the air and knocking birds out of the air and there would, there would be your dinner. The commercial, the commercial harvest of them began in 1850. And here's another big component as to why this bird became extinct so rapidly. It was the train and the telegraph. Because in 1850 alone, 70% of the juvenile passenger pigeons were lost. They became fast food for cities. And with the telegraph, shippers and trappers and dealers could easily communicate and find out where the flocks were traveling to find food. So they would just take their trains and they would just mosey on over to where the birds were and that was it. So it was technology also that led to the undoing of this animal. Um, you know, maybe a better managed harvest could have saved the species, but I doubt it. And there were efforts that were made, believe it or not, in Wisconsin in 1871, uh, nesting seasons, um, 100 to 200 barrels were sent daily. Each barrel held 300 birds. For 40 days, 2,400,000 birds were killed. And I don't know why it took so long for there to be, you know, attempts at legislation to protect them. But even when that happened, oh, what do you hear? This is just incredible. Just in, in 1871, 2,400,000. This is um, from the Indiana State Sentinel, uh, September 10th, 1857. Seven tons of wild pigeons were brought into New York City on the Erie Railroad from the counties of Steuben, Steuben and Allegheny on the 27th of April. 65 tons have been brought on this road since the 1st of April. Ah. So in 1857, a bill was brought forth to the Ohio State Legislature seeking protection for the passenger pigeon and a select committee of the Senate filed a report stating the passenger pigeon needs no protection, wonderfully prolific, having vast forests of the north as its breeding grounds, traveling hundreds of miles in search of food. It is here today and elsewhere tomorrow, and no ordinary destruction can lessen them or be missed from the myriads that are yearly produced. One to two million killed annually. There is a documentation that one man alone ships three million in a year and other documentation that 7.2 million were shipped from a single site. A single shot could take down dozens, nets could catch 1,300, clay pots filled with sulfur um, were ignited and smoked birds out of trees. This was an appropriate way of hunting for ladies. So there was no exertion, so uh, guns couldn't be shot by ladies. So that's the way ladies would go hunting for them. Um, in Ohio, the reports that they were throwing potatoes in the air would kill the birds. And the birds flew so closely together that a single shot could kill multiple uh, animals. But even more efficient were the net traps. The hunters would attract birds using a live decoy. They would blind the bird and tie it to a stool, hence the term stool pigeon. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, they, would be, uh, they would feed the birds whiskey-soaked grain. This is a stool pigeon basket we used to transport um, pigeons in 1919. That's interesting because that's after they became extinct. It must be, I think that's probably the uh, pictures from them. <clears throat> and here is an example they would uh, of stool pigeons. They would, um, is there a stool pigeon in this one? No, they're just laying down grain on the bottom and then they would, that trap would snap and catch them. And this next picture shows the stool pigeon over here on the right. You can see the little uh, pole that he's sitting on. He's flapping around and um, attracts birds and they throw tainted seed down on the bottom and then snap the net and off they go, killing hundreds upon hundreds of them. This is trapper Albert Cooper with his blind decoys used to capture wild passenger pigeons, 1870. So they purposely blind the birds or sew their eyes shut and they would just flap around to attract other, other um, pigeons, the wild pigeons. 
So live birds were also collected and used as targets in shooting galleries. The origin, origin of clay pigeons in skeet shooting, one trap called a plunge shooter would catapult live birds into the air. Sometimes people blinded the pigeon or ripped out their feathers and put kind of is terrible, it's true. Um, put cayenne pepper on their skin to make the birds fly in circles. These day-long shooting contests went on. One man reportedly killed 60,000 birds in one day. I mean, it was just, it was just crazy. It was just, they're so abundant, just let's do whatever we want. Let's just, they're never going to disappear. We can just go and kill 60. One guy can kill 60. Don't even get me going. Dinner will be on the table at four o'clock though. So get all your shooting done. This newspaper shred, a shed um, spread shows methods of capturing the pigeons for shooting contests. This originally captioned the sportsman's tournament at Coney Island, methods of trapping and transporting the pigeons for use in the contests. Wild pigeons are becoming very plentiful hereabouts. Shoot them or they will prey upon your wheat fields. They don't make a bad old fashioned pot pie. So towns would have what they would call pigeon years when a gigantic flock would appear and they were hunted in large numbers and baked into pigeon pies. There were so many birds flooding into the markets that many were just left to rot. They, their prices just plummeted because there were so many of them, just nobody wanted to buy them and they would just leave them there to rot in the gutters. Um, in the mid 1700s, even poems were written about passenger pigeons. <laughs> Here's a poem. When I can shoot my rifle clear at pigeons in the skies, I'll bid farewell to pork and beans and live on pigeon pies. Uh, here's a picture of some birds that were taken in captivity or some passenger pigeons and there might be some other pigeons in there as well maybe that little guy over on the right these whiter colored pigeons they're all part of a group of pigeons that lived in captivity in the aviary of professor Sia whitman he was a professor of zoology at the university of chicago in 1896 and it was his little collection of captive passenger pigeons that ultimately ended up at the cincinnati zoo where the last passenger pigeon died um, and we'll meet her very shortly. Conservationists were ineffective in stopping the slaughter, obviously. Colonies were still reported in Michigan and Wisconsin. A bill was passed in the Michigan legislature making it illegal to net pigeons within two miles of a nesting area, but the law was weakly enforced. Documentation exists of one man exporting three million birds in spite of the law. By the mid 1890s, the bird was all but gone. In 1897, a bill was put forth in the Michigan legislature asking for a 10 year, 1897, the bird is extinct in 1914. Um, a legislature asking for a 10 year closed season. Similar legislation was passed in Pennsylvania. By 1900, contests were being held with a prize awarded to anyone who could bring forth a live specimen. No results, none, not one. They were gone that quickly. So this young man is Press Clay Southworth. He is 14 years old. Um, he persuaded his mother to let him take a 12 gauge shotgun and shoot a bird that was eating corn on the family farm. And he said, I found the bird perched high in a tree and brought it down without much damage to its appearance. Southworth wrote this when he was 82. When I took it to the house, mother exclaimed, it's a passenger pigeon. This was the last recorded passenger pigeon in the wild. The specimen resides today in Ohio and its name is Buttons because the taxidermist used buttons for its eyes. It couldn't uh, find real um, taxidermy pigeon eyes. So that was March 24th, 1900. Which brings us to this beautiful Martha. So by the turn of the 20th century, the last known group of passenger pigeons were kept by um, Professor Charles Otis Whitman at the University of Chicago. And Whitman and the Cincinnati Zoo attempted to breed surviving birds, which included attempts at making rock doves. That's our common pigeon that we see flying all over the place. Foster pas passenger uh, pigeon, to foster passenger pigeon eggs. It, 
I have to have a sidebar here about our rock doves, our common pigeons. Um, I am a wildlife rehabilitator, and even though I don't work with birds, I, I, I handle bats. Uh, I did begin up at the Sharon Audubon Center in Sharon, Connecticut. And uh, I remember us taking pigeons in that had been injured, and some of them were surrogates to um, uh, young pigeons, whatever they call them, baby pigeons or whatever their name is. And they were the most beautiful mothers and surrogates. Uh, they, really, they really were lovely. So I can understand why Whitman and the Cincinnati Zoo were trying to use these birds to foster passenger pigeon eggs um, because they would do that. They're just really lovely birds. So in 1902, Whitman sent a female named Martha to the Cincinnati Zoo. And in 1903, he had about a dozen birds, but they stopped breeding. In 1906, he was down to just five birds. And these birds, again, needed to colonize. They had to be in big amounts in order for them to function properly. But there was Martha with her companion, George, by the way. He uh, died um, before her. But Martha died at 1 p.m. on September 1st, 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo at the age of 29. Uh, realizing that she was getting up in age, her molted feathers were collected uh, and um, conflicting accounts of how she died um, are all over this. Steamed ornithologist, just a zookeeper, more than likely she just slipped away in an instance. And it's believed this is the only time in history that the exact moment a species became extinct was with, witnessed. Her body was placed in a 300 pound block of ice and along with all the spare feathers that had molted uh, from her, she was shipped to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, where she was put on display in 2014 on the anniversary of her death. And I've yet to go to Washington to see her, and I really must. Isn't she beautiful? Robert Schurfeld in 1914 dissected Martha. He was very sentimental about this dissecting the last passenger pigeon. And after examining Martha's heart, which he refused to dissect, he remarked, with the final throb of that heart, still another bird became extinct for all time. The last representative of countless millions and unnumbered generations of its kind, practically exterminated through man's agency. Sixteen hundred to two thousand passenger pigeon mounts exist. Um, this is a local man, Michael Anderson, the proprietor of the Yale Peabody Museum, and Michael is holding in his hands White Memorial's version of Martha. So I am so absolutely thrilled that we do have this beautiful female specimen um, to show you this evening. Um, she, of course, is well over a hundred years old and in pretty excellent condition. Uh, we needed to have her spruced up a little bit. So several years ago, we sent her down to Michael, who is, of course, the person you would send something that is this priceless uh, to. And um, Michael worked on her. And I had the pleasure and the honor of going to Yale to meet Michael, who is an extraordinary man, um, but also to chauffeur our pigeon home back home to White Memorial. So um, here he is, uh, what a great man. And um, he's a story in and of, of itself. Uh, his, everything that he's created at, at Peabody is just ex beyond extraordinary. And I asked him because I have to know things like this. I said, if you could single out one thing that you've made and worked on at Yale that is like the creme de la creme, the top of the heap for you, your proudest moment, what would it be? And what it is, is the, I think it's a Triceratops sculpture that's in front of the museum. That is one of his pinnacle moments. Um, but what a great man and what a, what a pleasure to meet Michael Anderson and have him do some restoration work on our bird. So just last month in December, um, I went to the American Museum of Natural History for the first time since I lived in New York so, so many years ago. And my job was to hunt for extinct species. I was after a thylacine. I was after the great auk. I was after the passenger pigeon. And it's interesting. I came up empty handed in a couple of uh, areas. Um, passenger pigeon, yes, but 
it may be so sad because they're not in, you know, we think about the dioramas and, and the taxidermy specimens at the American Museum in those huge halls and those gorgeous dioramas that are painted there. And yet in a little back hall in this dingy, dank room of New York species, New York state species is a box with all of these passenger pigeons. And I mean, I'd like the display enough, but I just thought, my God, this thing should be elevated. This should be in a room unto itself, like a, I don't know, like a major work of art. Um, but they're in this dingy, dark little room, just all in this box together, and they're actually in beautiful condition. And I just took some pictures for you to see. One of the things that I uh, stumbled, I stumbled on another extinct species I wasn't looking for. The thylacine was off on tour of an extreme mammals program somewhere going around the United States. The great auk was in a, it was in a gallery that was being used for COVID-19 testing. <sighs> I was fit to be tied. And then, um, and I had my vaccination card when they let me in. Uh, and then who else did I try to see? Uh, the phylocene, the passenger pigeon, the great auk, those are the ones that I was mainly trying to see. Uh, so this is a conservation of wildlife of Canada, a book from 1921. Canadian birds, which have been exterminated within recent years and are now extinct, the passenger pigeon, the great auk, and the Labrador duck. And lo and behold, as I'm walking through one of the mighty rooms, one of the rooms with all the gorgeous dioramas at the American Museum of Natural History, what do I stumble upon? I wasn't even thinking of a Labrador duck, and there he is. So I got to take this picture of the Labrador duck. Um, this bird uh, believed to become extinct because after they got done killing almost all the eiders and they managed to kill all the great auks, then they went hunting for this little guy for plumage and for food. And, you know, it was just, again, um, they, explorers, colonials, etc. I love this photograph. Passenger pigeon eggs at $300 a piece, Washington, D.C., December 1st. Since the last passenger pigeon in existence died in Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, the eggs from the now extinct birds have become so scarce that G. Ellis Miller of this city is asking $300 a piece. You saw how small they are for, oh, for the three perfect ones in his possession with no takers. The eggs were left to Miller by his grandfather from a collection made 75 years ago when the birds flew in flocks that darkened the sky and broke branches off trees when they roosted in moss. Marjorie Beale, biology student at George Washington University, is shown studying the eggs, which are kept in display with carved birds and other eggs. I don't know. That's not where I would want to keep that above your fireplace and a box that looks like it could tip over and everything would break. But I just love the buttons on her dress. I, I like that frock. I think it's really nice. And of course, the hobby horse in the background. That's another place where I would keep my priceless. I just love that photograph. Oh, oh my goodness. Some compelling quotes for you. Jacques Cartier, 1491 to 1557, the great explorer, Prince Edward Island, Canada, July 1st, 1534, is the first to record sightings of the passenger pigeon. Uh, and he says, an infinite number of wood pigeons, and uh, quote unquote, that's a species that's in Europe, but not in North America. He was looking at passenger pigeons. What he was witnessing were passenger pigeons, species restricted to North America, not Europe, from where he came. Passenger pigeon was one of the wonders of the continent in the same league as the buffalo in the endless forest. The passenger pigeon was the most numerous bird that ever lived. In Cartier's time, between three and five billion of them. By today's standard, one third of the bird population on Earth. So his his big sighting was an infinite number of wood pigeons. Famous evangelist Cotton Mather, 1663 to 1728. There are never seen in the winter, but are some of the season birds, whereof I now propose to invite you unto an entertainment. And so are or wild pigeons, whereof thousands of millions visit us at their appointed season. The flights have been so great that for four or five miles together, they have merely darkened the horizon. They have been commonly sold in the marketplace, ready plucked 
and drawn for two pence or three pence a dozen, even to make a meal for half a dozen temperate people. We take them either with gun or with net. It is hardly credible how many at a time. Their numbers are of late years much diminished, especially on this occasion. When the time of their departure has been at hand about Michaelmas, they have in horrible storms missed their way and thousands and millions have perished in the sea where our ships have afterwards sailed through them lying on the surface of the water for some leagues together. Tis odd that though we have such vast numbers of them yet in Virginia, a colony of little to the southward of us, I am told that there is some what of a rarity, which will a little fortify a conjecture about the seas and birds, which I am now going to tender you. So even he was saying back then, um, diminishing populations. Nobody, I think, wrote a better documentation of witnessing passenger pigeons than John James Audubon. And here, of course, is his painting. In the autumn of 1813, I left my house at Henderson on the banks of the Ohio on my way to Louisville. In passing over the barrens a few miles above Hardensburg, I observed the pigeons flying from northeast to south southwest in greater numbers than I thought I'd ever seen them before. And feeling an inclination to count the flock that might pass within the reach of my eye in one hour, I dismounted, seated myself on an eminence, and began to mark with my pencil, making a dot for every flock that passed. In a short time, finding the task which I had undertaken impracticable, as the birds poured in in countless multitudes, I rose and counting the dots then put down, found that 163 had been made in 21 minutes. I traveled on and still met more the farther I proceeded. The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow and the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. Before sunset, I reached Louisville, distant from Hardensburg, 55 miles. The pigeons were still passing in undiminished numbers and continued to do so for three days in succession. The people were all in arms. The banks of the Ohio were crowded with men and boys incessantly shooting at the pilgrims, which flew lowered as they passed the river. Multitudes were thus destroyed. For a week or more, the population fed on no other flesh than that of pigeons and talked of nothing but pigeons. In less than a hundred years, they were gone. Great Scottish naturalist, John Muir. It was a great memorable day when the first flock of passenger pigeons came to our farm, calling to mind the story we had read about them when we were at school in Scotland. Of all God's feathered people that sailed the Wisconsin sky, no other bird seemed to us so wonderful. The beautiful wanderers flew in the winds and flocks of millions and climate to climate in accord with the weather, finding their food, acorns, beech nuts, pine nuts, cranberries, strawberries, huckleberries, juniper berries, hackleberries, buckwheat, rice, wheat, oats, corn, in fields and forests thousands of miles apart. I had seen flocks streaming south in the fall so large that they were flowing over from horizon to horizon in an almost continuous stream all day long at the rate of 40 or 50 miles an hour, like a mighty river in the sky, widening, contracting, descending like falls and cataracts, and rising suddenly here and there in huge ragged masses like high flashing spray. How wonderful the distances they flew in a day, in a year, in a lifetime. But well, one of my favorite authors is the great Aldo Leopold. The pigeon was a biological storm. He was the lightning that played between two opposing potentials of intolerable intensity, the fat of the land and the oxygen of the air. Yearly, the feathered tempest roared up, down, and across the continent, sucking up the laden fruits of forest and prairie, burning them in a traveling blast of life. Ah, oh, nobody writes like Elder Leopold. That's the Sand County Almanac. I cannot recommend that book more highly. Oh, and another Leopold quote, quote, our grandfathers were less well-housed, well-fed, well-clothed than we are. 
the strivings by which they bettered their lot are also those which deprived us of the passenger pigeons. Perhaps we now grieve because we're not sure in our hearts that we have gained by the exchange. The gadgets of industry bring us more comforts than the pigeons did, but do they add as much to the glory of the spring? Oh. Or some absolutely beautiful artwork. These are done by Lewis Cross. He was born in 1863, died 1951. He used his own mounted passenger pigeon as a point of reference for all of his paintings. And these are just beautiful. They look almost like illuminated manuscript paintings, just gold and gorgeous. It's interesting, I, I don't think I've ever seen before all the people that are in the forest below there. Um, I have to look at these paintings more carefully. Oh, my absolute favorite, of course, is Walden Ford, uh, born in 1960, he's from Westchester County, and I believe his, his um, studio is up in the Berkshires. Again, so uh, falling bow, those birds would land on trees and everything would just crash under the weight of them. There were just so many of them. This is um, this man died relatively recently. I want, I want to say in the last just several years, John Ruthman, Cincinnati. Um, Martha Leading the Way is the name of this painting. And this is a, in the background is the Cincinnati Zoo where she died. And this art is all painted by young people. It's Ruthman's art, um, but all students actually did all the painting of it. There's some really wonderful things on uh, the internet of uh, showing the students on scaffolding as they painted it and having the artist John Ruthman stand below watching them bring his painting to life. It's just really terrific. Um, sorry, I don't know who the artist is here. And I love this, uh, you know, again, that quote from the state of Ohio about how they didn't need protection. Shed a tear for the passenger pigeon. Artist unknown. So 19th century, the passenger pigeon was the most numerous bird in the world. Flocks up to 300 miles long flew in enormous clouds in the North American skies, sometimes taking 14 hours or more to pass. I love how the artist captures their beautiful red eye. This is where the largest nesting of passenger pigeons occurred, and it's uh, a monument in Pigeon Falls, Wisconsin. Close ups here. In the interest of the preservation of wildlife, we here dedicate this memorial to the ill fated passenger pigeon which from the earliest pioneer days until the 1880s flocked to these pigeon hills. This migratory bird, now extinct, was once so plentiful its numbers darkened the skies. Dedicated October 12, 1947 by the Boy Scouts of America. They used to darken the sky for days. I don't know the artist of this, and it's absolutely um, dark and breathtaking. Beautiful, beautiful painting. And this is my um, hero, Rex Brazier, who actually painted this bird in the wild. The next two, this slide and the next one are both Rex's. Uh, these are watermarked by Pantique, and if you're interested in buying Rex Brazier prints, um, his story is absolutely incredible. We can't we can't get into that tonight, otherwise you will be here till four in the morning. But it's one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite stories of ornithology, one of my favorite stories of Americana, 
one of my favorite stories of any person I've ever known of in my life is the story of Rex Frazier. And you can actually buy his hand colored prints from Pantique. I, I don't have a stake in Pantique's company. It's just that I purchased prints of Rex's from them. And um, they've, they've got beautiful work and they're very reasonably priced, but this is his passenger pigeon. You can't get your hands on this. I wish I could. I would love to have a piece of passenger pigeon art, but it's almost impossible to find. It is impossible. I don't own anything yet. It's blurry, but this is another one of Rex's. Again, he painted every bird and tree in North America from life. Yes, from life. That's the beginning of his story. And yet nobody really knows him or remembers him. Ugh, don't get me going. Um, these are a pair of images attributed to famed wildlife artist Louis Ibizis Fuertes, uh, 1874 to 1927. He died so tragically, and he was Rex Frazier's mentor, even though he was younger than Rex. Um, on the left is his painting of both a passenger pigeon on the top and our morning dove, which you see all the time below, and the lovely image indeed that... Um, it's a really lovely image, and Fuertes is one of the greatest avian art artists in the world. All of his works belong up at Cornell University. Uh, the other is one of his preliminary sketches for the passenger pigeon. There are some huge murals of his at the American Museum of Natural History. I just stumbled on those. I thought, oh my Lord. Oh my Lord, to see his work up close. This is from Portraits and Habits of Our Birds. Uh, originally issued as education leaflets by the National Association of Audubon Societies, 1925. Edward Howe Forbush is the artist, it's quite pretty. Passenger pigeon chalk art commemorating the 100th anniversary of the passenger pigeon's extinction, University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. It's very important that children know about this. And I know it's really dark, a dark topic, but you know we shouldn't ever um, shy away from teaching young people about, about this and our mistakes and how they can make it better. That's our mission here at White Memorial. This is from the original painting dated 1835 by William Pope. Uh, the original painting is in the Toronto Public Library. Uh, Pope lived from 1811 to 1902. Andrew Crichton, 1835. Um, this is Johann Seligman, Seligman, I'm sorry, 1749. I love this, the bird and its main source of food. You know, it's interesting, and I'll go on to the Audubon slide. Um, we've seen it already, but in this documentary I was telling you about earlier, From Billions to None, this is a really wacky theory that I feel has legs. And it really is thought provoking. Um, and there was a man in the documentary that said, you know, he believed that there wouldn't be any, any Lyme disease had the passenger pigeon survived. The passenger pigeon's main food is acorns. Acorns are the main food of deer and the mice that carry the ticks. And had there been passenger pigeons, there would be fewer deer. The pigeons would have taken up all the food. And he believes that we would not, maybe not even be speaking about Lyme disease today. And I thought like, wow, that is, that's a pretty big hypothesis, I guess. But it really is food for thought. Think about that. If the passenger pigeon were here today, well, we wouldn't be here today. But I thought that was a very, that documentary is really tremendous. Here's something new. This is George. We can't forget about him, The Last Male Passenger Pigeon by our artist Susan Matson. It's very pretty pottery. This is one of my favorites, Todd McGrain. He's an American artist who dedicated um, a lot of time to an extinct bird project. He created sculptures of extinct bird species and place them in locations where the bird was last seen. So um, this uh, passenger pigeon sculpture is at the Cincinnati Zoo. 
And uh, his great auk, of course, is up in Iceland. So I've seen his great auk up there. And all of them can be uh, seen at the Smithsonian. I believe that all of these are on display at the Smithsonian. On the left, the Labrador duck, the passenger pigeon, the great auk, the heath hen, and the Carolina parakeet. The bird even made it onto postage stamps. This is from 2017, a Romanian postage stamp. Even on Cuban postage stamps, Tanzan Tanzania. And just think about this, between 1840 and 1910, all of these birds became extinct. It was just a shameful period of time for us before there were laws protecting animals, before there were, was legislation um, passed to protect uh, species, the uh, Endangered Species Act. This is, this is how we behave. This is what happened. In just such a short amount of time, just look at that list. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And just shame on us. Dedicated to the last Wisconsin passenger, passenger pigeon shot at Babcock, September 1899. The species became extinct through the avarice and thoughtlessness of man. Could I throw us under the bus anymore? Let me play a pretty song for you. Nancy, let me know if this. Um, If you can see it and hear it well. This is the story of the last passenger pigeon on Earth. Passenger pigeons used to fly in flocks of over a billion birds. They were in, all over this continent and into Canada and Mexico. If a flock was to fly over your neighborhood, it would literally darken the skies for a week or more. If they were to land in a forest or something in your, in your neighborhood, when they would rise the next morning, it would look like it had snowed from maybe two or three inches of droppings. They were hunted for their plumage and their edible meat. By the end of the 1800s, there was only 14 left. And by 1914, there was only two left. They were in the Cincinnati Zoo, and it was a male and a female, and the last to die was the female, and they had given her the name of Martha. This is the story of that. Oh, high above the trees and the reeds, like rainbows, they land. As moon glow in greens and reds, they fluttered past the windows. Ah, but nobody came or saw. Till the hungry came in crowds with their guns and dozers. Soon the peace was over. God, what were they thinking of? Oh, on and on till dreams come true. You know, a piece of a song. Dozen. Till in a Cincinnati Zoo was the last one. Yes, all that remained was the last with the name of Martha. Very proud, very sad, but very wise. There were few who cared or could be bothered. How could anyone have treated you harder? And it was all for a dollar or more. Oh, on and on till dreams come true. You know.
song of whom wept around her. In a corner of the cage, they found her. She went as soft as she came, so shy till the last song. Oh, the passenger pigeon was gone. Well, um, that is that. They're gone. Except for a few specimens, well, thousands of specimens, 1,600 to 2,000 in collections. Um, again, thanks to Errol Fuller for his beautiful books and the National Audubon Society and uh, WBZ um, also for uh, some information that I got for this presentation from billions to none. That's in my head. Smithsonian, of course, Jessica Stanton, Ecology and Evolution graduate student at Stony Brook University. Uh, just a few of the credits um, for this presentation that took me forever to put together. Thank God for the internet, though. Uh, I do hope that you will come out and visit our 4,000 acre wildlife sanctuary up here in beautiful Litchfield, Connecticut, and our absolutely stunning, gorgeous nature museum. We are open. Masks are required. We're open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 9 until 4.30. On Sundays now from noon until 4.30. Um, it's truly one of the most glorious uh, natural history museums in the state, and I'd say, dare say, the United States. Uh, our passenger pigeon is not on display, which always kind of confounded me. Um, she's so important that she wouldn't be a part of our collection downstairs, but it is what it is. We get to pull her out once in a while and show her. So learn more about our camping facilities and our museum and our adults and children's program just by visiting our website, whitememorialscc.org. And that is what I have to say about that. I always start crying. Sorry. I really do feel like crying. Oh, <laughs> uh, I didn't mean for everybody to cry, but I just get choked up. I don't know, Aldo Leopold's quotes, especially. Um, some of these people knew her as well, the most beautiful writers. And um, you know, what can I say? That's uh that's it. Is oh Shailene's here. Oh my goodness. I love her. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I am more than happy to, um, you know, talk to you about anything that you would like to talk about. If you have any questions, that's great. And if you don't, that's great too. Yeah, I don't see anything yet in the chat. Maybe people are formulating something. I, I, okay. I, I just have to say that, it, it, you know, even though these are sad, they really are so important and, and it's, it's a little tiny way to celebrate. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I'm, I am, I guess I get choked up every time I do these things. And, um, you know, these, the series was born out of passion at a period where I was terribly ill. And, uh, you know, they take a lot of time to put these presentations together and I'm constantly adding more, updating them. I told you I just added my New York slides just moments before we did the presentation tonight. Um, and during the pandemic, all of a sudden, people started taking interest in them. And I'm so grateful because it's such a, a, a powerful topic, it's such an important topic. And um, I'm just really grateful to all of you librarians that have booked us for this series because um, it's something so special to me and the stories are profound. And, you know, I'm just happy that you see the merit in, in them and that you booked me for the series. Now, do we have, are we doing one more? Do we have- We're doing one more. We're doing the thylacine. We're doing the thylacine next. Oh my goodness. Ugh. <gasps> that was oh, gonna be another sad one. <laughs> They're all sad. I mean, there isn't anything happy about extinction. There's nothing happy about extinction. No, there really is <laughs> There's something that we can always learn from it. And, you know, a lot of people don't even know what a thylacine is. They think it's like some sort of drug, I think. Or, you know, have you put thylacine on that sore that looks kind of cute? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But um, the thylacine is a, an absolutely spectacular animal. And it's the only mammal 
that uh, that actually I feature in in the series. It just seems like birds have taken the lion's share of of hits by the colonials. Um, you know, obviously the bison was almost brought to the brink of extinction, and you know we do have other mammals as well. But the thylacine is one that is especially it's such an unusual animal, and its extinction. I think is probably the most heinous of all of them. So you'll learn about that at the uh, during the next program. And if you don't have any questions, you know, I, 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 I'll just say this: the, uh, watching these, it's hard to. I guess uh, you know, hindsight is everything. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to imagine that people didn't realize what they were doing. I I totally agree. I totally agree. I guess, you know what, though? Just think about it. This is the days before social media. They're just out there on their own. They didn't realize that there were other people doing it probably as well. I mean, the passenger pigeon was one because, again, here we all of a sudden have the telegraph and the train. So people had to know what was going on. But it was just, they were just so, it was just so stupid. You know, the great awk and, um, uh, the, the great auk, uh, you know, so far-fetched and um, the dodo was just on this one little island. People didn't even believe that the dodo existed. It, it became extinct so rapidly that a lot of people said, that thing, that's a fake thing. That thing is even so weird. That, that never even existed. So, uh, but the passenger pigeon, you would think that it, they would have gotten at the thylacine, certainly, because the last one died in the 1930s in captivity, of course. Um, but some of these other things, the off, you know, I don't think that people realized, I don't know, that they were just loading up into boats and didn't think that they were making that much of an impact. And when you have legislators, in the case of the passenger pigeon, they're going to pass legislation. There's millions of them around. They're not even, there are no threats. Come on. I don't know. Um, maybe we just weren't in, as in tune as we are today. Um, because we are so bombarded by all of these, whether they're correct media outlets or not, social media or news, you know, uh, companies, we are still getting bombarded with information. They didn't have that then, so I don't know. I'm not. I'm not giving them a free pass, by the way, Nancy. By the way, I'm, I'm throwing. No, them I. I just. I, 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 you know, I don't know if they, uh, honestly, I don't know if they knew, you know, I, I remember reading a book called Changes in the Land um, about New England when the, when the colonists first came here. Mm -hmm. And the rivers were so full of alewives that you could walk across them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's really hard for us to imagine. Mm -hmm. Um and so maybe it was also hard for them to imagine that that would stop. Right. It seemed endless. I mean, think that John, the John James Audubon passage, that is just incredible. Mm -hmm. Days and days and days. How in the world could you ever make an impact on that population? I yeah. mean, it's just amazing that you could even, that you could even raise a you know a farm and crops with that many birds flying over all the time I and mean, you must soil yourself every year when they decided that your area was the area where there was food and they were going to nest and oh yeah you know, have their yeah, young. Can you you wow hard it's just it's very hard to imagine but um i think you know the passenger pigeon we really have such an incredible amount of documentation on it that really paints that picture of, of how it happened and why it happened. And, you know, beginning I was like, well, it's just, you know, we were just killed all of them. Yeah, we killed all of them, but we completely took their habitat from them. And there was, there wasn't a, there were, there were a bunch of factors involved with this animal, this bird that, um, that contributed to its demise, not just people shooting them and, you know, killing them indiscriminately. We just completely leveled them. There, as I said in the beginning of the program, the day the first colonial stepped foot on this continent was the beginning of the end of the passenger pigeon. There wasn't a hope in the world for it. They could have just lived in peace and harmony with native people. But the colonials were just like, woohoo, here we are. Let's set up shop. Plunder. 
Oh, well, Nancy, it is what it is. All part of history we learned from history. Well, said Linda Whitaker said, um, before she left, said, thank you. I had no idea of any of this. It's a real eye opener. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And that is something that, you know, uh, I think a lot of people just don't know this. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here, Nancy. Mm -hmm. We're not just here to show you pretty pictures and make you laugh. We're here to make you cry. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> 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 oh, Nancy, you're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, you know, everybody for coming this evening. It was a really nice group tonight. I'm, I'm very appreciative and look forward to the next one whenever it is. I can't remember. I feel like a rock star. You make me feel like one. It's at the beginning of February. I can't remember the date right now, but it's the first week of February. I look forward and to I, it. I thank all of you for coming. I, uh, I hope you learned some stuff and I hope you're not too sad. Uh, <laughs> but learning something, I think, is good for all of us it's always good for us always good for us yeah thank you so much stay well and i'll be talking to you soon okay jerry thanks bye always bye. as always thank you very much good night thank everyone you. Bye -bye. hey thank you nancy